The only thing we have to fear is beer itself. Beer. So many choices. Oh, we no function beer well without. Woohoo! Beer! Hello and welcome to another episode of Beer Busters. We're going to bring in the news and reviews of your favorite brews. My name is Dan Baker, joined by my co-host and brewologist. Steph Hefner. From the great state of Ohio and the demented and fermented. Wayne Baker. <laughs> Off to a Did great you say from? It, well, live from. Currently in. Yeah, currently I'm in. I'm definitely not from Ohio. Joining from the us, great state of Pennsylvania. Joining us I'm, from the great state of Ohio. I'm on my way home from Chicago. That's where I spent my time. Not just, I don't want people thinking I choose to spend time in Ohio. Hey, hey, <laughs> Cleveland is there. You ever see Sorry. that? It's an old two, an old YouTube video. It's like the 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 <laughs> Cleveland Tourism Board. The only thing I remember is like, and here's a payphone. Who the fuck still uses a payphone? Actually, yeah. it does sound familiar. See, I think there I've we go, that. right? <laughs> Cleveland is a cool town. We're about 30 miles south or 30, 30 something south of uh, Cleveland. We're right off Interstate 80. Nice. By the time the world hears this, I won't be here anymore, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, you could give your exact location. You will never right, yeah. again, so it's fine. Yeah. It's just <laughs> at least a week and a half By the way, out. quickest tangent ever. We haven't even gotten through the end. I, I was going to say that was a very quick tangent. <laughs> That's what I aim for. That's what I aim for. Uh, there's going to be, a, I have a feeling, a lot, a lot of those. I mean, not only uh, apologies to everyone involved. Not only was I not on the last episode, but it feels good to be back. Uh, it just it feels like a night where we're, we're just going to. We're going to talk about whatever comes to mind, and that is A-OK with me. But we have joining us, not from the great state of Ohio, uh, but from our wonderful state of Pennsylvania, from Our Town Brewery. Uh, Rob Tarvis, uh, co-owner, uh, co-founder, and uh, head brewer at, uh, at Our Town Brewery in Lancaster. Uh, we, we opened up in 2020, uh, the fall of 2020, so we had a couple months to uh figure out what the hell was going on with the world uh, before we opened our doors. <laughs> um, I've been at it professionally about 12, 13 years brewing. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys for having me on here. And, yeah, look forward to talking about whatever the hell comes up. Yeah, of course. Awesome. And thank you for joining us. I was really yeah, hoping sure. some there, somewhere in there you're going to say, yeah, born and raised in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, hey, you listen to this right now. You, you know the drill. Follow along. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. We're at Beer Busters. Facebook, we're Beer Busters Podcast. You can go to BeerBustersPodcast.com. Don't forget to add slash shop. Or if you're on the website, the shop button is in the top menu bar. You can also just click on it rather than retyping the entire URL. That's a little trick for those of you on the World Wide Web. Uh, yeah, you- although if you're on mobile, I think you have to hit the drop down menu and then scroll down to the bottom of it, though, because it doesn't. the menu is not the same on mobile. That's true. That's very true. Thank you for for uh, clarifying. Uh, remember on YouTube, we are Beer Busters Podcast. And there's also Patreon.com slash Beer Busters, where you can get access to fun things like behind the scenes feeds. You can get Last Call. There's the uh, the punishment video archive, all for as little as a buck a month. You know how people say like, oh, just don't buy that. Co-. No, like it's a dollar. Where are you getting coffee for a dollar these days? Nowhere. That's a good point. Nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> well. We do have a lot at hand. I want to, since we are all drinking beers, I'm going to go around the horn and say what we're drinking. I, myself, have a Redding Premium from Sly Fox. I took uh, took our dad there for Father's Day, Wayne. I got myself oh, a six-pack nice. of, uh, of Redding Premium, got a salad, had some real good Mediterranean food, and uh, it was a good time. I had They had a, oh God, it was a uh, Maybach? I think it was a Maybach that was on that I had. It was really, really good. I mean, all the beers at Sly Fox are always incredible. Well, the goat race was just last month, so it could have been the Maybach mm. for the winning goat. That makes sense. I feel like it was a name, so that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go next because I don't often have a beer. I know. I was going to say. On weeknight recordings, which are most of, almost all of our recordings now. But um, I just got back from my honeymoon, Woo. which is why I was not at the Father's Day dinner. I didn't or lunch. I didn't skip it because I'm a bad son. I was out of town. Um but I stopped at uh, Barnstable Brewing while we were up there. It's actually the only brewery we got to. I drank some beers from some other places. But um, I have their Bavarian Slam Munich Dunkel. So I thought since I have a beer that's related to my recent travels, I could crack it open on a Monday night. As previously mentioned, I'm currently on my way home from Chicago. And we went to the um, 
Mars Brewing has a really awesome tap room and coffee shop in the Bucktown neighborhood. And um, what? It's called Life on Mars Community something, Community Club. I don't know. We spent many, 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 many hours there. It was within walking distance of our bread and, bed and breakfast. But I'm drinking there not just for Tuesdays, um, which is a Czech Pilsner with toasted buckwheat and black peppercorns. It is um, like, it is very, that I sounds, drank a lot of Mars beers this weekend. That sounds super interesting. Peppercorn pills. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And it's an alliteration. Um, I am. I love alliteration. I'm drinking uh, our English brown ale. It's called Pull Up a Chair. Um, yeah, I just came inside from the swampy PA. We finally got hot and humid here. I was like just loving how it wasn't hot and humid. But I came inside my house to do this in the coolest room in the house. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to drink some dark beer. So grabbed a brown ale um, that I found in the back of the fridge. We canned it like two months ago. Um, tastes, some, tastes some great. Really chocolatey. Yeah. I love a brown ale. I was just going to say I love a good brown ale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good choice of style. For the yeah, year. it's one of those ones. I think it's funny. Like when I, I, my business partner, brown ale is his favorite style of beer, which I think is just hilarious because you just don't hear that very often. Um, yeah. <laughs> and his wife is also like just a huge brown ale fan. Like you could just like sit there and you could be like, oh, they just love, oh, they just love their like lo lo lagers. Their pilsners are they're huge haze heads. They're, they're all about sours, but like two married people that are just like obsessed with brown ale. Brown ales. <laughs> I, they, I love in, it. They're in their kegerator right now, and he owns the brewery. He has mad chefs dynamite brown ale <laughs> in his kegerator at home. <laughs> that yeah, is nice. an like, award-winning brown ale. Yes. It sure is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, love a, I love a good brown ale, but that being your favorite style is kind of like your favorite fruit being like pears or something or like... Like some weird yeah. thing that you never hear anybody say that there's their favorite. Or like star fruit. Yeah, like some weird <laughs> like that. Or cantaloupe. Or like, you know. Yeah. Although I do really love cantaloupe. People think like I'm weird. As well. yeah. Only if it's ripe. Yeah. That's true. That's true. But I do when love we first, that. Uh, speaking of tangents, the first like couple months we were open, we, we like started brewing a little more quickly because like we were really busy when we first opened. And then I started brewed this like light lager and I had like one plan for it. And then like we got shut down and we had to like so sale, you know, bear, the beer just started moving slower, and I was like, "Let's come up with something more interesting to try to move this quicker." So we did a cucumber, cantaloupe, and honeydew American light lager. Whoa! And people, I would say, eighty like percent of people just like despised it. Twenty percent like adored it and would like wanted to take half barrels home. Like it was. <laughs> It was such a love hate thing, and it was just moving so slowly. But uh, oh. yeah, I haven't thought about I haven't thought about touching melon in a beer in a while since I was kind of like scarred. Um, but I thought yeah. it was really cool. That's like I, we just I just went and bought a bunch of fruit and like pureed it all up myself and with my business partner Rob, we were just in the kitchen with like an immersion blender and slicing up fruit and cucumbers for like six hours. Wow, that sounds I really imagine. refreshing, though. That sounds really good. Mm. It sounds interesting. I would love to try it. I imagine you yep. need a lot, though, especially honeydew and cucumber don't yeah. like impart a ton of flavor. I would think it it had it really like registered. It's it had the like aroma of like that Bath and Body Works like cucumber melon <laughs> uh, like I, lotion. It had it smelled like that. It really take me back to high school. Uh, no, <laughs> oh I know. God, yeah. it was and that was not what I was like going for. But I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it smells like something you bought for your like eighth grade girlfriend uh, for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it uh, it was super like chuggable, and we had a bon me on the menu at the same time. So like, you could just this beer, and we called we called it side of greens. <laughs> but it was uh, I I really liked it, and the the our chef at the time loved it. But it was one of those ones I'm just like watching how slow it moved. We ended up dumping the last like third of the batch down the oh, drinks. So it was just it would have been on tap to a point of like embarrassment. So it's like all right, let's <laughs> just get rid of this. You've we had, had it? it. Yes, <laughs> I thought so because I remember the first time we came into the brewery, it was when like there were no seats at the bar, you know, all the tables were separated. Oh, and we just comedy. came in yeah. and got a bunch of crowlers to go yeah. just to try. Yeah, we that's right. We got six crowlers to go. <laughs> <laughs> we did. 
<laughs> I vividly remember this. And I'm like, this sounds really familiar. I feel like that was one of the crawlers we got. And it, yeah, it was. Nice. Do you like, yeah, it was. Look at this. 1.25. We loved it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't rate my beers, so I don't. Yeah. I can't tell oh, you nice. if, I, okay. if I liked yeah. it or not. Do you ever think yeah. you might bring that back as like a small batch? That sounds really cool. I'm kind of upset that I missed out on it. I've talked to a couple of people, like some staff that doesn't that didn't work for us at the time when they like it gets brought up randomly as it's like kind of like let's all make fun of me for that beer that I made that <laughs> no one liked. Um, <laughs> some of our staff is like, can you make just like one keg of that? Because that like even if you just took like our pills and like put all those fresh things into it, I think that could be really cool. And so we <laughs> talked about it. You could do it kind of like a, a Berliner where you pour the light lager and then just squirt the syrup in to get like the an ode to the original beer. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could do, do a you could do a firkin. I feel like nobody does firkins anymore. We I have a skin with a light lager. We have a beer engine. We we've done firkins a couple of times on the bar, yeah. but we have an engine now just so we don't have to like worry about selling it all in like a day. Yeah. yeah. Cast beer is one of those things, it's like as much as I love it, it's just like not for everyone. It should be for uh, Oh, yeah. I always freak out when I see a cask somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. If I see one, I'm like absolutely ordering. Yeah. Unless, there's no questions asked. The only caveat is like every once in a while, you'll be like walk into a place and you're like, oh, fuck yeah. Beer engine. And you're like, what do you have that? And they're like, uh, we have this English barley wine. It's like 13%. And you're just like, oh, mm. <laughs> it is Tuesday. It is lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say like a uh, dark mild. <laughs> or like an ESP, maybe. Yeah, for the most part, though, if there's an engine, I'm I'm trying it. I went somewhere, and I don't remember where, and I don't know if I would say the name of it if I did, but I remember I went somewhere, and they had a beer engine, and I asked about it, and they were like, oh, there's nothing on it. We don't usually use it. It's just, like, decoration. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so That's a shame. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it may have been, like, left over from a previous brewery that had been in there or something weird like that, but, yeah, it was just bizarre. Oh, uh, I mean, uh, they're a ton of work. I'm not like sitting here trying to tell you that like it's just like one of those like oh everyone should have one. Like they are work. They are frankly like annoying to keep up with. But when I see like someone come into the bar that's just like just loves beer and like in, in every format, they're like you don't see it everywhere. And so you're just like it's very exciting. Like we've seen people, and it's you know it's not a lot of people in their 20s and 30s, but like you know you see the person who like maybe spent some time in in england or or just or has been or has been drinking beer since the 90s or early 2000s where they were a little more common and they're just like thank you so much for having this on and they'll sit there and like we have this brown ale is actually on our hand pump right now we have i just carbonated a small amount of it to can um the rest of it was all cast conditioned and so people come in it's like five percent they'll sit there and drink two or three of them and like they're content they can safely drive home you know it's like just a light option that doesn't leave you burpee and full it's awesome i love it yeah i love it too i always love a good english style and cascale yeah uh, yeah you don't really see yeah. many english styles in general anywhere i feel like you're starting to see a little more of them though but still it's all Have you guys uh hit up bond place at all in bethlehem oh yeah Mui. <laughs> yes Mui is one of the best beers it's in existence. it is it's world class like it's, yeah. it's so good I, well, I just, and Nemo. Like, via phone met. Sorry, go ahead. Nemo is equally as phenomenal. I mean, usually our go-to is Mui, but Nemo is their. I um, actually is the bomb. Yeah, ne- Nemo is the dark mild, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could drink eleven of those every day <laughs> until my heart stops beating. <laughs> um, I love that beer. I finally got. To, I sort of met Sam via uh, a message thread on online, and uh, the owner brewer from from Bond Place, and I. I got a phone call with him recently and it just seems like the nicest dude ever and i was just kind of like oh, singing yeah. his praises and he was like oh man it's like just so nice to hear people that like our beer and i'm like what i was like everybody likes your beer yeah yeah i'm like you know how amazing your beer is right, right? he's like yeah i mean I, he's like we're like really little and I, I had no i've never actually been to the brewery my brother's been there and brought me cans the fridge in lancaster has had their cans i've seen it on draft up at the bull's head and so, like, in my mind, like, they have a little bit of a reach. So, I thought they were bigger. And he was like, dude, they're just, like, tiny. And they rip the English stuff. Like, yep. they just home run everyone. Like, it's it's so yeah. good. It's so on point. It's so subtle. It's so nuanced. It's, so, it's just, it's English beer. It's, it's great. Yeah. Really good. Haven't been there in a Sam, very long Sam time. Is, but it's, 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 always, it's always a must stop if I'm in, if I'm in Bethlehem. Sam oh, is literally sure. one of the nicest people in yep. the industry, hands down. For sure. Yeah, and, he's, we, and, he, we created, and he's been in the industry for a long time. 
we've created his bromance with Ethan from Stickman. We've we've made them besties. So. Oh really? Yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm very very proud of that connection because they're two of my favorite people in the industry, and that they have a bromance now makes me very happy. They're a really funny. They they are like both really goofy, but I feel like really different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, That's it was just funny. it started like I'm like you need to watch Ethan's Instagram videos. And I was like, and you need to watch Sam's. Like they both have this really funny and smart way of using social media. And like, that was the Very, first way yeah. I got them to connect. And yeah. And now they do collaborations. Well, they call it the, the best it's to, uh, shorten it like the best beer in Pennsylvania, but it has this yeah. very long, not humble <laughs> beer name, but it's, <laughs> and don't ask it's them what style it is. Yeah, it's an ale. It's an ale style ale. It's an ale style ale and beer, beer flavored beer. Beer flavored beer. <laughs> oh, I like that. My very first brewing job was at a um, Elk Creek Cafe in Milheim, which is like thirty minutes outside. Oh my outside god, of... I love Elk Creek. Uh, Elk Creek is a special place. Um, it is in this like little like one traffic light town, uh, halfway between where I grew up in Lewisburg, which is where like Bucknell University is, and State College. It's like pretty much halfway. So like, when I was at at Penn State, I would like meet my parents there for lunch, stuff like that. But I ended up that ended up being my first brewing job. And uh, Tim Yarrington, who uh, he's now like the department head of the Penn State's brewing program at uh, Penn Tech, but he he's still the owner and the brewmaster at Elk Creek. But he he has a beer just called it's called the Little Village MFA. And with if you add, I think on their packaging it says multifaceted ale. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> quietly in the in the brew pub, it's called motherfucking ale. Like it's just, <laughs> like, it's like it's it's lots of malt, it's lots of hops. Like if, if you, I don't. It's like he's like, what style? He's like, I don't know. It's like it's, it maybe you could kind of call it like a double IPA, but not anymore. Not in like this world of double IPA. He's like, it's just it's ale. It's like just bold beer. Like just drink it. <laughs> Shut up and drink it. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Yeah, he's what like it's clean, it's balanced, it's bold. Just get after it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What years were you brewing there? Uh, I was not there very long. I was there for like, I don't know, eight months or something like that. I, it was right before I moved to Lancaster. Um, fall of fall of 2011. I, with my brother um, got his doctorate mm -hmm. at Penn State. So whenever we would go up to visit, that was always our Sunday brunch spot. We would always go there for Sunday brunch and beers. Yeah, and the food's so damn good. The beers are always clean. A lot of English stuff there, too. Um, and then they always had, like, awesome live music. Well, yeah, and funny thing, the first time I ever heard my brother sing was uh, on a YouTube video of a, a performance that night. Apparently, he was friends with one of the women that was performing, and he got up on stage and sung with her. I'm like, I didn't oh, know shit. you sang. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> the crazy yeah, things you learn. Yeah. Neat spot, though, for sure. Yeah. There is a, uh, I don't, neither of you have probably been there. There is a Port and PA episode where um, they went up there and interviewed Tim and some nice shots of the the restaurant and the town and that crazy tiny intersection where they're located where all the trucks try to turn and you're like, they're not going to make it. But No. Yeah. I remember so the, in the back alley, there was like trucks that would like end up having to turn around back there. And I remember when he first hired me, he was like, Hey, um, like when you're done, you know, like cleaning out the mash tun and like you, and he was very slow to like the guy, I had just been homebrewing for a few years, like no professional experience. And he like was very slow to like show me things and then like watch me do something and then let me do it by myself. Like it was very apprenticeship style learning. And he literally, I mean, like, I don't know, it's probably long enough ago that he doesn't have to worry about legal stuff. Like he didn't pay me at first. Like he started. Uh, it was like every hour you work for me, I'll let you follow me around with like a notepad and ask me questions. He's like, you have to understand how much that slows me down and how like, like laborious that is for me to like, just teach someone something that didn't like spend either like the time to learn it or the money to go to school for it. So like, if I'm going to give you information, I need you to give me something. So work for me and I'll, I'll show you how to do stuff. So I would just like wash his kegs on Mondays and then I would get to either filter a beer or brew a batch of beer with him or transfer or watch him clean a tank or so eventually I like kind of learned about a, enough things that he would let me then do them on my own. But yeah, he was like, go ahead and, uh, you know, get the mash done cleaned out of all the grain and then like pull the, the false spot and like pull, pull the grates out and scrub them. And I like pulled them out and sat them. The back garage door of the brewery like was right by the mash. Tun, so I like, sat them and leaned them against the garage door. And he came like racing around the corner and was like, Whoa, whoa. he's like, 
he's like, trucks come down here all the time. He's like, if a truck comes down here and runs over my fucking bottom, false bottom of my mash, he's like, we can't make beer anymore. <laughs> he's like, don't ever do that again. I'm sorry for yelling at you, but like, we don't have enough money to be replacing equipment. <laughs> Just don't leave my shit in this alley. Like, okay, sorry. <laughs> Lesson learned. Oh, wow. That's, That's funny. Yeah, that is funny. Yeah, it was a cool way to learn, though. So, and actually, like, kind of full circle, um, he's the department head of the Penn State Brewing, uh, Brewing Science Program at, or Fermentation Science Program at Penn Tech. One of his graduates is starting next week as my assistant brewer. Oh, no oh wow. Way. Oh, shit. Oh, that's yep. cool. Is his name also Rob? <laughs> his name is Luke. <laughs> yeah, that would be too good. Yeah, anyone that was named Rob, I just uh, threw out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had enough of them already. Great resume. Terrible name. Terrible name. <laughs> Terrible name. Uh, so maybe we should actually go back to the beginning. So we know, you know, you had your eight months there. Maybe share where did your brewing journey go from there? And at what point were you like, let's open a brewery? Um, so I had one of those days at work where like you get big news. So like I went to work at Elk Creek and Tim was like, hey, man, you've like really progressed a lot. And um, there, I you know, we're looking to grow production a little bit. And so I wanted to like talk to you about a full time position. And I was like so excited. And so I go home and I go to talk to my girlfriend at the time, my now wife. And uh, I was like, wow, I have great news. She's like, me too. And I was like, you can go first. And she's like, I got into grad school at Millersville. Like, I want to move back to Lancaster. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> she's like, What's your news? I was like, I got like offered a brew because I was bartending at Otto's actually at the same time, the other the brewery in State College. So and I and I'd been like begging those guys for a job, but I was like, I finally got like a break like in the brewing. You know, imagine there was like three thousand breweries in the country at the time, not ten thousand. So like brewing jobs were like really not easy to come by. Um and so uh hers seemed more promising. She went to a back to a, a program to, so she could uh, get her t- certificate. She's now a third grade teacher. Um mm-hmm. So we're like, I was like, okay, that seems like more adult and like the right thing. So we moved to Lancaster. Um, so I let Tim know at Elk Creek that like I, I wasn't going to be able to take like the full time gig, and he left me to stick around until I was moving. But uh, I had applied at Iron Hill, Springhouse, and Lancaster Brewing Company because um, they were like the three breweries that were operational at the time in Lancaster. Um, not the county, but this in like Lancaster, the city, I guess you would say, or like town, you know, Spring House is in Conestoga still at the time. And uh, no one got back to me except for LBC and they were hired. So went for an interview and Lancaster Brand Company hired me. Um, and after I started, it was just like not quite what uh, I had signed up for. Like as far as they kind of said that my role would be one thing and it was like looking like, I was going to be in a warehouse packing mixed cases of like variety packs, like four out of five days a week. And I was like, Oh my God, I can't do that. Like I just, I need some variety. And at the exact same time, Matt Kesey, the owner of Springhouse, uh, hit me up and was like, Hey, like, I, sorry, like your email. He's like, we get bombarded with emails. We're a small business. I like missed your email. Uh, we're hiring for an assistant. Do you want to interview? And so I did. And so I was only at Lancaster Brewing Company for like two months and I left to go to Springhouse, and I was there for five years. Um, so I was at Springhouse back when they were um, in the barn still. Like mm-hmm. that was, I think, three or four of my years were down at the barn. Um, and then I was part of their move up to Hazel Street. And then when I got to Hazel Street, I just wasn't really like digging the, the size. Um, we went from a 10 barrel brew house doing like, I don't know, we were probably doing like maybe 14, 1500 barrels a year out of that barn, just like brew as much beer as we could. Um, to the second year at Hazel Street, we were on track to do 8,000 barrels a year. I don't know what they do anymore, but like we had a sales guy and we were filling every tank, selling them as fast as we could. And it just felt like factory work to me. Like I kind of lost the like, can I, again, like all the way back to Elk Creek, like I love that community attachment to beer and like that grain to glass in one building kind of thing. Um, you know, a lot of brewers love it. Like tap brew, like brew pub brewing is so fun. Um, and so, um, I left Springhouse, worked for a bit for my friend Lane, who opened up uh, Levin Goods, the hard cidery in Lancaster. So I helped him open up the cidery, thinking like that would be a little scratch the itch of like the small, you know, like one room kind of facility. And it was, it was a little seven barrel batches of cider. And, but I just didn't like 
cider is not my thing as far as like the production of it. It's a lot of cellar work and not, you don't really have that like recipe formulation side and the, the brew day isn't really there. You just kind of like are getting, we, we would get local apples pressed and, and then just kind of ferment it. So it kind of wasn't very, so I was only there for about a year. Then I went to Mad Chef and I was a Mad Chef for two and a half years, uh, right up until we opened our town. Um, and my, my plan to open our town started in the lit, like the last few months of working at Springhouse. Um, it was something we always wanted to do. Me and my business partner talked about it when we graduated before I even got the job at Elk Creek, but we just knew we had no idea what we were doing. So we took the route of instead of like being homebrewers, opening a brewery, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, plenty of people doing that successfully, even in the area. Um, but we just took the route of like, let's go learn the industry, learn the ins and outs. Let's go network. Let's go meet people. And we thought we'd open the brewery somewhere else. Honestly, we thought we were going to open it maybe back where we grew up in Lewisburg or, um, or just find kind of a gap somewhere in the state, uh, that like really like the community that needed it. And we ended up deciding Lancaster was a good spot for it. And so we started writing a business plan in 2017, um, started looking for buildings at the same time. Um, took us about two years to find a building and, two plus years to find money <laughs> and uh yeah opened in 2020 so now that and then, then a pandemic and yeah right yep that was cool that was yeah. the, the building Good which is um it's right up the street from central market uh in lancaster so it's a great location an easy walk that from in that downtown area but that's a, a pretty historic building as well isn't it like a hundred years old what was it before um, you guys took over. So yeah, kind of an interesting building story in general because the building has its own story. So like the building we're in is now 101 years old. Um, it was a Buick dealership. Uh, it was built to be a Buick dealership um, and tire sales and auto repairs. And like, so they had the entire building. We're only in about a third of the building square footage wise. Um and they had the whole building. I mean, like they just, must, this must've been wild. And they were only open three years and they closed. Um, wow. So it was a ton of things in between. But then like when we found it, um, the f front half of like our building was empty. The other half was like a Vietnamese uh, takeout place and pool hall, kind of a funky uh, <laughs> setup. And then uh, the, the upstairs where we have an event space and the back where Hem Hempfield, uh, our neighbors are, they did like, um, it was an awning company. They did like those huge tents that are over like the bumper boats at Hershey park. Like they would like <laughs> repair those and clean them and scrub them. And like, it was just an odd like company that you just would never think about, but they had been there so long that like the Lancaster city kind of grew up around them. And they were like, this is a terrible place for us to operate our business. Like we should be out <laughs> along the highway, it like a warehouse and like loading docks and all this stuff. So, um, the building got, new ownership and they kind of moved over. So it was kind of, kind of a funky building and like it was it's old. So like they've got everything. Like we needed new electric service, new HVAC, new lighting, new plumbing, new guy. Like the only thing that really stayed was like the brick. Uh, yeah, it was just like a total gut job. But I just found out a few months ago that the location that we were at, um, right before they knocked down the building and rebuild it as the Buick dealership, it was like a very high end brothel huh? in Lancaster. What? <laughs> yeah. This past Thursday, we just, what's today, Monday? Yeah, just a couple of days ago, we hosted a history happy hour and they had like notes of like very high up, like uh, people in the government, like talking about like going to these brothels and how it was like really fancy and like one of the nicer ones in the area. And this was all like prohibition ish time. Um, oh. Pretty neat. So we did, yeah, we, we, it sold out in like less than a day. It was like 120 tickets. So we're, they weren't going to do it again. It was really cool. cool. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Now, I want, my question is, if you had known that before opening the brewery, would you have like leaned into that history and like the branding? Um, I don't. It's 2023, man. It's pretty easy to piss people off. Yeah, I was going to say maybe that wouldn't be such a good idea. But it's like a ready-made backstory that's like intriguing. But yeah, no, it's yeah, no, it's interesting. And I think like Lancaster history, like the uh, organization, like approaching us was a really natural way to do it. I think like yeah. leaning in and like 
maybe finding too much jest or comfort in that would have offended somebody, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which like, you know, not that we don't make our statements where like, we feel like they need to be as like a culture for our company, but like in general, like the shirt I'm wearing, you know, not that they'll be able to see it, but like our like secondary mark for the business is like a brewery for everyone, which like, it's something that's really important as far as like the beer styles we brew. Like, you know, like I said, we have English Brown, we do hazy IPA and sours and lagers and, and dark stuff and all, and kind of everywhere in between. But like, you know, just making sure this is like really just a place that we just feel like everyone can be comfortable um, and feels at home. So yeah, I don't know. It was one of those ones like that, especially back then where it was like every penny was so scary to like lose. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I would have leaned in too heavily to the, <laughs> the brothel past. Well, I think you made the right choice. Yeah. Here's our beef brothel stew. Oh, <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, I really appreciate the bad pun. Yeah. <laughs> I really and it do. was another alliteration. Uh, yeah. 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 So if the, if, the, if the secondary, I guess, slogan for it is uh, brew for everyone, is that where the name came from? Our town? Uh, no, you know, so my business partner and I, um, he was not married at the time that we, um, like started writing all the documents and like business plan, all that stuff and looking for buildings. So it was him, uh, myself and my wife. And we were like driving around, uh, sometimes fairly aimlessly, like up and down, like literally crisscrossing through the town, trying to be like, is there a cool building? Is there a cool block? Is there a cool, just like. And in the meantime, we would like stop in and do like competition analysis at Springhouse and Lancaster Brewing Company and Wacker and and Mad Chef, and we would just like have a beer and like take pictures of the menu and figure out how much they're charging for everything and like what does the clientele look like. And we were driving around, and all the while, like in between all the car rides, like taking time to just like snowball brainstorm ideas. And I just had this thought of like, hey, you know, we really like want to be mindful and like connected to our community. What if like it just the name is popular. Like, what about like our town? You know, like this is like our town. It's like our brewery. Like people can like really feel like it is like their own thing. And like our, you know, people in the neighborhood of the community. And my wife, my business partner hated it. They were like, that is so generic and boring. And like, that is, they're just like, no. Well, you and, got the last laugh. Yeah. Well, so like a couple weeks later it marinated and they were like, you know what? Like, I don't know. I think I like it now. And I was <laughs> like, okay, all right. Uh, and I, I was still kind of sold on it, but like, you know, you're starting a business with people. You can't come, you know, you don't want to start by being like my way or the highway. So I was like, all right, let's all like come to an agreement on something that we're all really proud of. And yeah, so that was just more of like, a, um, I like the name for what it is, but then also it was like, it's something that we've used to help guide us in like how we make decisions. And I think that um, we said it, a couple months after we opened, we did like a port and PA special. And I told him like, you can't like, you know, you don't come into your business, like, uh, selling Starbucks coffee and your coffee stout and, and, uh, just getting like the cheapest white bread from us foods. And blah, when your name's our town, like we carry like local bread and local coffee and local, like our beef is from a local farm. And like, it just helps us as like a kind of like a guiding light a bit too, of like just the way, what we care about. And like, don't let us be distracted by how difficult it can be to run a small business. So like when you stamp your name as something, it's really like you cannot bullshit, (laughs) you know, like it is really important to us. So like, don't let it not be important enough that you like start changing the way you make decisions. So it's kind of helped as a guide for us, the way to to run the business too and how to manage staff and everything. So, yeah, no, I like that. I mean, if you, if you deal with the, the local, businesses you know you get your local coffee your local meat whatever like it just helps you plant your roots a little bit more that way you are more involved in the community so i i, I like that you took that and you ran with it and it seems to be working out really well yeah so i know you guys have the um philadelphia tap room coming over coming yes, soon yes. so i'm curious are you going to continue to use the same local partners that you're using from Lancaster County, or are you going to connect with some Philadelphia based companies and sort of give the Philadelphia tap room its own version of our town? Um, so a little bit of both. Um, and we're still in, this is still a little bit in limbo. Um, but just as like a really low hanging fruit example, um, 
like outside of like our own beer, like the beverages we're gonna serve. Like we made a decision, we're gonna keep carrying, we're gonna bring Levin Goods hard cider down to Philly. Like he doesn't sell any cider down there. I think it's gonna be a really unique product to have down there. Nice. Um, whereas like for our cocktails, we're gonna work with Top Dog canned cocktails for like, you know, so we've had a connection with them uh, for the last few months and they're out of Lansdale. Um, you know, and like we talked about having a little bar snacks like maybe we bring Hammond's pretzels down, like a good, you know, kind of like give people a little flair of Lancaster but yeah take kind of the same mission and, and like fold in like being one with the neighborhood there um on the fairmount area so i think it's uh it, there's going to be lots of little decisions that get made along the way that'll like paint that picture a little better but um yeah we worked with like a local muralist uh she just did work for the philadelphia eagles and she just painted uh something inside our space that will probably reveal in the next few weeks on mm -hmm. social media. But um, yeah, just kind of like wanting to lean into that. So that was part of the thought too, is like this name is scalable to move to other areas that we feel like we can connect with um, in a genuine, like an organic way and not feel like it's kind of forcing itself to be the Lancaster version of our town down in, on Ridge Ave in Philly. So mm -hmm. Hold on. I have to, I'm sorry to ask this question. I know this is a terrible question, but do you have an idea of when the tap room will open? <laughs> um, and you can say no, it's okay. September. Oh, word. Cool. Yeah. Of yeah, this I mean, like, year? It's, the space is pretty like done. So we were just waiting on uh, PLCB approval before our landlord wanted to start doing some of the build out for the bar. So we just got that like a week and a half ago. And so, um, I think they're going to be drilling floors for plumbing this week and starting to build the bar up next week. And so oh, we have equipment yeah. that's already sitting on the floor there and we have some other stuff ordered. So you're going to be right um, across the street from Lorraine. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I love that bar. Oh my God. Oh, that's really cool. Yep. That's a nice one, two punch. <laughs> there yeah. Go. There's, there's just not a lot of places to drink over in that neighborhood. Yeah. We, uh, my girlfriend used to live not too far from there. She lived uh, like a block behind that Aldi that's there. Um, and yeah, okay. on like New Year's Day or whatever it was, we were walking around and there was nowhere to go. Lorraine was closed. That's like a smaller operation anyway. But yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we wound up trying to go from there to like, oh God, we tried going to Love City. They were full. We tried going to uh, ProTap. They were full. Who else was full? All of them were. So we just wound up like going back to her place and drinking whatever beer she had in the fridge. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens with that neighborhood. And I, th I feel like you guys are getting in there at a real good time. Yeah, we're excited. There's a ton of residential that's new, and they're, um, the the commercial just hasn't filled in yet. I yeah. think a lot of that's just kind of like aftershock of COVID, yeah. um, both like interest rates and banking and people like clinging to cash or maybe not having a very good couple of years or worried about what might be coming. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously we, we think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're really excited, though. And, yeah, so that's what like Luke, the new brewer, started next week is so we can crank out. Like we have the ability with our current uh, equipment to brew almost double what we brewed last year. Um, wow. So we kind of planned for that when we opened. We we, we bought a uh, 10 barrel system, six 10 barrel fermenters, and we were like, we wanted to be able to handle like one, at least one like expansion, whether that was just being super busy in Lancaster or whether that was wholesale or whether that was a second location. So without having to scale up and shut down to water tanks and all that jazz. So we are very fortunate that that plan worked out nicely so far. That's cool. Yeah, cool. So you said you, you opened officially in 2020 in the fall. Were you, on, yeah. were you on track to open earlier that year and did it get ra uh, derailed by the pandemic or was that kind of, was that the goal anyway to open towards the end of 2020 regardless? No, we were actually supposed to open in September of 2019, but then oh, we just wow. kept on hitting, we kept on hitting snags and snags and snags. And then finally got to the point where um, we were pretty close. And I think we probably would have opened in like June had there not been a global pandemic. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we would open probably like mid June and that didn't happen. And like construction stopped. And then when they returned, some things were still delayed. Like for instance, like our walk-in cooler, like was just one of those things that like they were just waiting on and waiting on because it was all those supply chain issues yep. in the early days of COVID were really brutal. Hi. What are you doing? I'm on a work call. Hi guys. Just walk. My five-year-old and two-year-old. Oh, hi. hi. We will pause for children. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's and funny. dogs. Oh, yeah, children, children and pets. pets. My daughter is wearing Christmas flannel pajamas outside right now. It's 84 degrees and probably like 300% humidity. I love it. Oh my gosh. That's say amazing. Hi. 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 Say hi. This is Freddie. Hi, Freddie. Hi, Freddie. Hey, Ren. hey, look. That's Ren. Hi. 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 <laughs> hi. <laughs> They're all at different places. Yep, all over. <laughs> He's like, where is that? <laughs> it's the magic of the different internet. Places. <laughs> different yeah. places, USA. Have you yeah, heard, so have you was, heard of um, Ohio? <laughs> kind of, yeah, Ohio. There, it was kind of just like funky, weird timing, delay after delay. So, But then when, when Code first hit, I didn't, we didn't want to open. We were like, you know, delay us as long as you can because uh, we're afraid to open in this climate. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that, that didn't like when, when the, when the construction workers went back and to like finish up all of our stuff at the tap room, I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Because I just knew it meant we were going to have to open. And I was like, this is not a good time to open. Like, no, you know, there's six foot rule and no bar seating and, yeah. and all that. So, but, uh, you know, it, we're still here. It worked yeah, out. It worked um, out. not only are you still there, you're expanding. Yeah. yeah, man. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. And I think your the space is nice and open and um as awkward perhaps as the setup was when you guys first opened, it did work. And the few times I was there during the pandemic, um, you guys were usually at capacity, COVID capacity. Um, so people seem to to latch on. Were you surprised by the or perhaps relieved by um, the turnout and that that people were were coming out even despite what was going on in the world. Um, initially, yeah, like it was it was a really good five weeks, but I, I I I will never know like what our grand opening would have looked like. True. If we would have had like a normal runway and like, you know, we never got to see the place just like absolutely bananas like. Four deep at the bar because they're the new brewery in town. Like that makes me a little sad. When I think about that, but um, well, that'll you know, happen when you when you re-release the cucumber melon John. Then <laughs> you know people will come out. Yeah, we'll be lined up at every other brewery in town needing a beer. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. I don't know. It was a little funky, but it was as as then like once we. I felt like like thinking back about that now. It, it was. It was good out of the gate, and then it set up like you know we we're like, oh, I don't, how long is this going to go on? Because yeah, like we we're, we'd open on a Wednesday, and there would be like we'd be at capacity for the first seating, but that didn't didn't last very long. Um, you know, and then you kind of fall into like what your new normal is. You think, but you don't know. Is it COVID related? Is it business related? Is it just like is the local community like everyone came once? Is for forty percent of the population still not coming out because they don't want to go out to eat yet? You know. So it was kind of weird. Like, I feel like we, until it took us like a year and a half or maybe more to like start to feel like we had any sort of tracking or understanding of like what the hell our normal is. Um, so, I mean, we were super appreciative of anyone that came out every time, but it was just such a tight, like most of our staff that we opened with are not there anymore. Um, we like about six months after we opened had like a lot of new staff and they're all still there. But I like I've thought about it recently. And I really think part of that is like that was just such a stressful, awful time. And I feel like our staff was wound tight and the customers were wound tight. And like, that's not what you want when you go to a brewery. Yeah. Like you're trying to like recreate and like relax. <laughs> like, And so it was just like everyone being like, does that table look like it's five feet apart or six feet apart? Or like and the staff being like, you know, that person's not wearing a mask. And as a business owner, you're like, I don't want to make anybody mad. It was just it was all just like really, really awful. Um, you know, I mean, grand scheme of things, like business is fine. Everyone's health was fine. Like we never had any issues. We like major issues. We followed every rule that was thrown at us. Um, and, and we're still here. So I can't really, I try not to think about it too much to be totally honest with you. Well, it's so interesting how I, I'm pretty sure almost every single episode that we have recorded since the pandemic we have had what we call our COVID, COVID segment corner. like you do almost feel obligated to have this conversation but i also think this is a neat way to record this time in our history and it would be interesting to listen back to these stories um 
like years from now. And perhaps people that open breweries that are young children right now or weren't even born during COVID for them to, to hear these stories. And, you know, I, I we often even talk about listening um, to music that was written during the pandemic and like song lyrics and, you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> looks like a snail. I love it. It, it does love look it. like a snail. It That's looks just like a snail. snail. That you. should inspire a beer label right there. Sorry, it looks like was, a snail. No, that's that the weird. perfect interruption. I can you one. I'm gonna grab a beer real quick, but I want you to repeat that question. I feel like you were. That was a really like what you were saying, Steph, was like really solid. I feel like and should be said again. Not to make you totally repeat yourself. But <laughs> Well, I am. My day job is also an elementary teacher, so I'm used to young children talking over me and me needing to repeat myself. So no worries. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, give me one second. <laughs> oh, I'm finally warming up. It was so. I always sweat when we record the podcast. The snail. Yeah. Oh, Lolly hop. Oh, nice. So good. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know the best way to, to have you start that over, but I liked the question you were getting to, I think. She's having back pain. So she, we can see you doing your stretches in the back. <laughs> I'll try turning the screen. <laughs> oh. Okay. Pause and save. But I think thinking back, I'm pretty sure uh, – over the last several years since the pandemic, every episode, we've the pandemic has come up in conversation and we've talked about this. And I do think it's really interesting hearing yeah. about different brewers and business owners perspective and their experiences. But I also think this is a good way to record this time in history. And because um, I think about some of the brewers that, you know, are either young children now that will be brewers in the future, not children that are brewers. So God, Um <laughs> Or, you know, people that will open breweries in the future that did not experience this time. And I think it'll be interesting for them to recount these stories and and it'll be interesting to hear their perspective and their take. And this this is history. This is our reality. Being, I was going to say textbooks someday, but textbooks are kind of a thing of the past. But yeah, but it definitely has like shifted. It it is made and has continued to make like stamps on the industry that aren't going anywhere. Uh, at least in the near future. And like, you know, we'll just, it, you know, it's kind of, it's always comical to look back and like, think about the, like, Oh, let's everyone stay on for two weeks. And there was like, you know, some percentage of people that thought <laughs> it's like going to just be a 14 day like pause. And then everything was going to be fine. Um, so I always tell people like when we always looked at it through the lens of like, this isn't a light switch, it's a dimmer switch. So like, they're not just going to flash the lights back on. Like they're just going to mm-hmm. slowly come back on. And like, we aren't going to know when it's as, at its brightest. Yep. Wow. That's a great. Starts to... Yeah. I like metaphor. that a lot. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but that was just a really good metaphor. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, and then my camera. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> make... in your camera. Yeah. We just don't, you know, and you just won't know like when, until it starts to dim again. So like having these moments of like, you know, whether it's sales, like, is this as good as it's going to get, or whether it's styles, or whether it's format of, like, 16-ounce cans versus 12-ounce cans versus slim cans versus, like, how much wholesale should you, should you do, or what should your price point be, or, like, how every man do you want your product to be versus how exclusive do you want to make it look, and, like, how much, I, you know, it's just, like, all these little tiny things that are just also, like, not even touching on, like, if, you know, infrastructure as it relates to, like, some of the, or not infrastructure is totally the wrong word, but just like some of the um, supply chain issues and how it relates to grain prices, not really like, mm-hmm. and making sure, you know, so it's just like a really, it's, it's just put a massive stamp on like the brewing community and like, we're always trying to make sure everyone can still like feel like beer is cool and they want to drink beer and they like beer. And, you know, uh, I don't know. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And like doing that through like a survivalist mentality is not ideal, but makes you have a lot of attention to detail well and even your reflection uh a little bit ago about how stressful it was for your staff at the time i'm sure that's something that you're way more in tune to now having gone through all of that making sure that your staff is you know taken care of and um you've seen a lot of that in the the 
the beer world and the bar scene lately, you know, making sure that s- staff is safe and, and consumers are safe and putting, you know, safety and, and mental health, those things are are starting to become at the forefront of conversation. So I think, you know, when you survive something like this, and especially as a business owner, when your business survives, um, I think you pay attention to things in, in a different way. And you may even prioritize things um, slightly differently than you would have had not for that experience. Yeah, for sure. No, I think there was, I mean, it was an interesting time to go from an employee to an employer. Like I was a brewer and a, and a four day a week brewer, one day a week bartender at Mad Chef when in mid, mid March, 2020, I never went back to work at Mad Chef. Like, um, I, I, I just, that's not totally accurate. I, I would, we did like, we called it ships in the night. Uh, there was, the brewers would go in and work one person at a time. And so like someone would be in there from like eight to three and then someone would show up at three 30 and work till 10 PM. And we didn't like want to see each other because we all like little kids and well, but we would like continue to make beer. Um, but I never went back to work with that crew again. And so I like just kind of in a flash just went from being like an employee from the time I was 16 at my first job until I was, you know, whatever, 33. And then like the next time, like, there was a paycheck involved. It wasn't a stimulus thing on a weird card from the government. It was <laughs> me signing a paycheck to a person and ho- hoping that they liked their job and hoping that they wanted to come in again and hoping that they like felt safe and like respected and all. So just an interesting, like a really, really interesting time to like snap and be like, I'm no longer on this side of the fence. I'm on this side. And I think that would have been interesting anyways, but to do that at the exact same time, because like all these other things you had to process was just bananas. Okay. No more COVID talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My brain is just like. I know. I know. I really like the dimmer switch analogy. I'm oh, yeah. No, that was good. That was good. <laughs> I think he's crying a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. I was really touched. I know. When you said you, you we won't know when it's its brightest, I was like, that's like really insightful thing to say. Yeah. Like, I just, yeah. I'm going to just send me the audio of just that so I can. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, welcome to my TED talk. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned you mentioned cans, uh, and Steph, you mentioned that when you were there, you got a bunch of crowlers. Has canning been in the cards since the beginning? Is that something you always knew you wanted to do? No, in fact, I said I would never can our beer. Was, uh, is is that something that came out of the thing we just said we weren't going to talk about anymore? <laughs> um, actually, I don't. I, not directly, but indirectly, yes. Yeah. So I think what happened, I don't know, I believe what I think, yeah, I guess what I believe happened is COVID forced people to really get used to a packaged product mm-hmm. and drink less pints on site and all these things. And I think it launched some breweries into having to package their beer. Like a great example is like Four Man's in Ephrata. Yeah. They were like, tiny little three barrel draft only local brew pub, blah, blah, blah. And pandemic happened and they like turned and just like ordered a canning line, like instantly. They were just like, we'll figure out how to pay for it. We're going to buy this canning line. And like, we actually have that canning line now that bought it from them. Um, but cause they expanded and grew them, but like it set up the customer to expect packaged beer from even the smallest brewery mm-hmm. i'm not like blaming four mans i just mean like you go to a lot of smaller breweries and they might just like hand can their beer like i know like moo duck i think does like really small individual things and uh bespoke and like they just kind of like they like pre-packaged small amounts for the week and things like that and so from the customer side it's a four pack and a 16 ounce can figure it out our town like make it, you know what I mean? Like, and so we were doing crawlers only and we were blasting through crawlers and then like that's just slowed up a little bit and I'd be in the brewery, like, you know, doing whatever brewing or cellar work and you'd hear someone come in and have a, have a, a mug of our Pilsner or like a, a pour of our press on or our new England IPA. And they'd be like, Oh, this is great. Like, do you guys do this to go? And our bartender's like, yeah, 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 yeah. We can do anything to go. Um, 30 shots can crawler. And they're like, Oh, no cans. Okay. And they would leave. They would not buy. Like it just, it, it was like haunting. You'd be like, you're just watching like 
beer not get sold and money not go in the drawer over and over again. And you're like, oh my God, we need to fix this. So did what I didn't want to do and put our beer in cans. And um, it's it's pushed our volume a bit. Um, and it's something we're still learning. Like packaging is a whole science and art that is is pretty new to me. Like it's not something I did a lot of in my, you know, I've been brewing for a long time, but a lot of that was, was pub brewing and wasn't, and I wasn't running canning lines and things like that. So packaging equipment's new to me. So, um, yeah, sorting through it. Um, we, we sell most of it in house still. Like we don't set it out on shelves or sell stacks to beer distributors. Like there's a couple of places that'll get like cases here and there. So we're, we babysit it pretty hard. Um, but yeah, it was not something we thought we'd do, but now we're leaning into it more and more. And, um, it's definitely a very, it's a big part of, of our model now. So, I wonder why people would walk away from a crowler because they wanted like a sixty, like a four pack of sixteen ounce. Is it a volume thing? Because it's only like two cans worth. I think, at least for me, it's there are times when I know I don't want thirty two ounces of beer. Like tonight, yeah, I want, and you can't I want one can, and I don't want any of it to go to waste. Yeah, yeah, or or, or like you know, and a lot of times with like, there's just so much beer out there too. So I mean, like, yeah, when somebody grabbing a four pack, like. Like when I take a four pack, I'm like, I am drinking all four of those beers. <laughs> um, <laughs> not necessarily in a sitting, but like, you know, my wife and I like, we like beer. So like, it is not like, I don't think like that's a large purchase, but, um, you know, to some people they're like, the four pack is great. Cause like I have friends that like are just, they just love sipping and sampling stuff. And so like my buddy Andrew is one of those people. It's like, he would be like, I got a four pack and it's like, I want to keep one can um mm-hmm. I, I saved one for you if you want to trade up something cool if not whatever and I, I have one for your brother and like he has he has kind of a home for them he like just buys one to like spread it out and the, and the crowler very much is like just a drinking way to take beer home as opposed to like a experimental way to take beer home i think i don't know and it, it is it's tough like sometimes I can't tell you how many times i've like dumped half a crowler down the drain the next morning um you know, because it's just flat yeah. in the fridge because I, like, decided to go to bed and not just muscle down another pint for no reason. Yeah. When it's getting late and I have two kids and all that stuff, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. it. It's, I, it was always I there, love that, that the 12-ounce can is making a comeback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, well, that was, was a good way to do two different formats of cans right now. I don't know. We might look I into mean, my, it. My opinion may be unpopular, but I do love a 12-ounce can. 12 is great. Yeah. I like the 12. Um, there are certain things I just want really cold, too. Like, um, I love Sunshine Pills from Trogues. It's like oh, my great all-time beer. favorite great beer. beer. It's just like such a pro such a pro offering. It's so damn good every time. It's so consistent. Um, and I just like, you know, it's hot as hell out this time of year. And, like, I like the 12-ounce cans. They do 16, and they do now they do the 19.2-ounce Sunshine Pills. Um and like that's cool, and like I think in the fall maybe I'd be into that. But like, man, like keep just twelve ounces at a time. I want it cold. Yeah. <laughs> it's hot out. So yeah, I we like were the just too. talking about the nineteen point two ounce cans uh, when uh, Julie from Denizens was on. Right, mm-hmm. was Denizens. I couldn't remember who it was, but yeah, we now know that that is an imperial pint. That is why yeah. it is that measurement. Yes, and a lot of yep. venues want that size. Mostly Live Nation venues. Want it. They just want to be able to yeah. charge you twenty two dollars yeah. for it. Yeah, they, the guys at Trogues told me that basically, I don't know, a very large percentage of that is going to stadiums. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it was surprising to learn that that's such a barrier to entry for a lot of small businesses to get into, like, especially music venues. Stadiums are kind of like, you know, the big goal for everyone. But even like small music venues, they refuse. They're like, if you don't have 19.2 ounce cans, we're not selling your beer. No, and, well, and, and they want it like cheap as hell. It's a really yep. terrible can size for the brewery. Like they just make yeah. like, they just make like such little money on that format. Yeah. But. And then they sell them for so much. But also sometimes like not a lot. Do you ever go to like a beer distributor or like a gas station in PA and see like a uh, new trail broken heels for like three seventy five in like a 19.2 ounce can. And you're just like, I know how much, how many pounds of hops you probably threw into this beer. <laughs> like, <laughs> Did y'all make like four cents by selling this can? I don't, it's just wild. I don't know how, but 
yeah. scale of so do, scale does of new time, does new trail can in 19 points rounds cans yeah they do 12 16 and 19 too are there beers in any venues uh what does mean? they sell a shit ton of beer yeah i yeah dude, they might be at the point where they might distribute they're they're up there in distribution as far as there? Pennsylvania breweries go, they they are probably one of the. Now I know we have some, like Gingling, and I mean we have some really really big names in Pennsylvania, but they've got to be up there. I'd love to see their yeah, I'd love to see their parallels numbers at the end of this year and just see where they're at. It's later. I would text Mike. Why the <laughs> hell are you canning nineteen point ounce cans? Because yeah. <laughs> well, he wants to be at Sheets. Yeah. Yeah, I mean <laughs> it's got. It... I want to be at Sheets. <laughs> I don't ever want to really be at Sheets, but <laughs> I used to love Sheets. Then I moved to Philly. It used to Sheets used to be good, and then now it's just so bad. See, that's the thing. Wawa used to be good, and now they're pretty. Wawa bad. used to be good. Wawa has gotten they're really awful. Bad. Yeah, have First, they or have we have we just grown up? That's a very valid question. I've thought about this recently. A little bit of both, but they've also taken things off the menu. First, they got rid of the horseradish, creamy horseradish, to add to your your chicken salad, Hoagie, if you're me. So then I switched to cherry pepper relish for like two years. Now, all of a sudden, no cherry pepper relish. Now I have garlic aioli as my only option. Stop it. (laughs) Do you hear what's coming out of your mouth? I just don't need a gas station selling aioli. (laughs) <laughs> it is kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's just like uh, when people be saw, it's like it's like Royal Farms and the fried chicken. It's like, can we not like lean into gas station dinners? Like, we well, apparently, need... apparently, their fried chicken is extremely good. It's supposed to be incredible. I haven't had it. There's one a There's stone one. throw from my house, and I refuse. I, I've had it. It's, but I, I refuse to go back. It's so bad. Royal Farms is responsible for the single worst cup of coffee I've ever had. Is that the green? Or is it green packaging? Their coffee? No, you're thinking, uh, at least I think you're thinking green mountain. Something about mountain, yes. That is the worst gas station coffee I have ever Oh, had. God. Ugh. Is it the coffee or is it because gas station coffee is always burnt? It's both. It's it's the coffee and the way it's handled. Yeah. Just so bad. Such a coffee snob, too. <laughs> I've definitely what be, I've become one. Use if, you're brewing, if you're brewing a coffee stout, what coffee are you using? Uh, depends on like what we're trying to do, but like we've, we've usually worked with passenger Mm -hmm. coffee Mm -hmm. out of Lancaster when we've done coffee beers, we've used three or four. They're different of their, like different blends from them since we started something like that. Passenger's good. Yeah. I also really like, uh, Lancaster County coffee roasters. Yeah. There's a lot of good uh, coffee. Yeah. Their Lancaster blend is my favorite. That's good stuff. Good drinking coffee. I don't know how. It's like a nice smooth. I just use that stupid word. <laughs> <laughs> That's Dan's word. I was going to say. I know, I'm not, am I'm I not spo- finishing that sentence. Am I supposed to start saying quite tasty? Is it quite tasty stuff? <laughs> it's quite tasty. Okay, good. I responded to someone. Somebody commented on a, a picture I posted of a flight of beers. And I responded with quite tasty. <laughs> <In> your honor. <laughs> Thanks. Quite tasty. <laughs> quite tasty. Well, uh, dare I ask, Wayne, should we, uh, should we start playing a game? I want to play a game. Are we ready to play a game? Think, would you like to play a game? I think I we like should. Game. Yeah. Let's play a game. Cheers, the internet. And welcome to Happy Fun Time Games. The podcast trivia segment that knows where to get a cup of coffee for a dollar, but is not telling anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Today on Happy Fun Time Games, we're actually returning to a game that I haven't done in uh, quite a while because it gets harder and harder and harder to find entries for it. Unlike libation or fabrication, that gets hard, but like new funny beer names always come out. But this is, there's weird in my beer. So for the uninitiated, this is a game in which I will tell you a little bit about a beer that has an odd, unusual, strange ingredient in it. And you must tell me from a list of three multiple choice options what the weird is in each beer. All of the beers in today's game came from the Strange Brew Fest in 2017, which I think is a beer fest that I've pulled beers from before, but these are new ones from that festival. 
So the the thing is, the, the best place to find like beers with weird, strange ingredients is at these weird beer fests because there's a lot of these weird beer fests all across the country. The problem is a lot of these beers at these beer fests are only brewed for the beer fest. So when you look them up on like Untapped, there's like no notes or no. So it's like really hard to to find things out about them. But I've dug in and found the details that I could find. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about beer. And you must tell me what the weird ingredient in each beer is. And we will begin, as we always do, in time-honored tradition to my left with Dan. First, a rare occurrence in this game. I'm going to tell you the name of this beer before revealing the answer. I usually don't do that because sometimes it gives it away. This beer is called the German. While there are many good beer-related reasons for that name, the inspiration for this particular beer is actually a bit more culinary. It is a pilsner. But it is not Ryan Heitzgebot conforming due to the inclusion of, is it mustard seeds, sauerkraut, or schnitzel? The answer I thought was going to be there was not there. I'm uh, curious. What did you think it was going to be? Black licorice. Ah, uh, no. okay. Okay. Um, no. There's way better ways to get that flavor. Oh, for sure. Yeah, undoubtedly. But isn't black licorice like a, like a popular snack in Germany? Uh, I didn't. I mean, I don't I've been know. To I don't twice know. And I didn't know. My brain is pulling that fact from an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and I'm sure that's wrong for a million fucking reasons. <laughs> uh, mustard. Well, I can tell you it's it's wrong for this question because it wasn't even an option. Well, obviously. <laughs> uh, what was it? Mustard seeds? What in a schnitzel? Sauerkraut. Oh. Ugh, God. In a it's pilsner. A, it's a pilsner. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say mustard seeds. Dan going with the mustard seeds. Steph, what do you? think? Uh, well, sauerkraut doesn't even make sense. Why would you do that to a pilsner? Um, Why would you do anything weird to a pilsner? Oh, right? mustard, <laughs> mustard seeds is the only one that, like, I can Why would you put cucumber and melon in a. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to say mustard seeds also because I don't uh, approve of the other two. All right, Steph, agreeing with Dan with the mustard seeds. Finally, Rob, mustard seeds, sauerkraut, or schnitzel. All right, so isn't schnitzel um, basically... Like it is meat of... that is pounded and then pan-fried or deep-fried. Oh, shit. I was thinking of, what, spot, spotzel? Or oh, spatzel. yeah, spotzel. Spatzel. The, yeah. Like the spatzel egg drop noodle. Egg noodles. Yeah. Oh, as I was going to say, I thought it was, I was thinking of spotzel, like the noodles, because if that's, I could see people using it as a starch. Never mind. Mustard seeds, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not meat. I love that. I love Not that string of, contra- stream of consciousness right <laughs> Everybody said mustard seeds, and everybody Everybody's is wrong. Correct. Hey, oh, yes. <laughs> it is the only one that actually makes sense out of all the weird options, and, and and the only of those three answers that I'm like, hmm, I'd like. Because is it <laughs> so? Sa- sauerkraut's yeah. too acid, so it'd mess it up. And schnitzel's more of a style than it is a food, right? Yeah, that's the thing. I think schnitzel is more of like the pe- preparation method than it is the actual thing. I was going to use spatzel. <clears throat> but I felt like schnitzel was more well known, and it's a funnier word, so that's what I went. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> well, I mean, aren't there breweries that have put chicken nuggets in beer? Isn't that kind oh of yeah? Thing? Yes, yeah. I mean, but on. usually it's an IPA. <clears throat> usually it is an IPA. So this beer is from <laughs> the Depot Craft Brewery and Distillery, and it's made with mustard seeds. And I wish it was made with schnitzel, but it is not. Moving on to our next beer of the game. Steph is going to guess first on this one. Next up from Drake's Brewing in San Leandro, California, is a frickinization of their Robusto Porter. Speaking of frickins, they took this award-winning beer, the Porter, and brought it down to ground level with the infusion infusion of aged oak and, is it mulch, mushrooms, or slime mold? Mushrooms. Going with the mushrooms. Rob, what do you think? I was going to say mushrooms, too, because we've, con- we've kicked around using candy cap mushrooms to bring out maple in a dark beer. So I'm going to say mushroom as well. Right. Mushroom and a very reasonable reason for picking picking that answer. Dan, what do you think? Uh, what style of beer was it again? This porter. was a porter. porter. I thought, okay. Um, I am also going to say mushroom. Because I know you can get other flavors out of there. And I know, not saying this is a trendy thing, because you said this is from like six years ago. But one of the trendy things for coffee alternatives now is mushroom coffee. And coffee and porter go fairly well together. 
Interesting. I have not heard of mushroom coffee. I'll, I'll have to look into that. That's we clearly everybody's saying mushroom. We clearly listen to different podcasts. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> everybody's correct again. It hey. is in fact mushrooms. Also, like the only really edible thing in that list. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could technically eat slime mold. It's alive, but like I don't know that you want to. But yeah, so they call it their robusto porter forest floor edition yeah. uh, which is served in a firkin with the aforementioned oak american oak if you're picky about it and french king bolete i think it's how you say it mushrooms reports on the ground say that the porter was possessed of a dry earthiness complemented by a rich roast and chocolate flavor so again i would be interested in trying that beer i'm curious if they dried the mushrooms first yeah, the this thing about these beer fest beers is you can't really like unless I call up the brewery and be like, "Hey, how did you make this?" There's like nothing on the internet about it because it's like served once and then it's gone usually. Yeah, it was like one keg. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little disappointing, but it's also like the weirdest, coolest, weird, strange, funny beers are always at these fests. Moving on to our penultimate. Oh, there's the word. Beer of the game coming to Rob to guess first for the first time this evening. We head back to the depot, which we visited earlier this evening, for our next brew, the style of which is described only and mysteriously as ranch ale. (laughs) The answer to this question is not ranch dressing, for better or worse. Okay, good. But there is something decidedly ranchy in this beer. Is it baked beans, grits, or barbecue dry rub? You're not giving us the actual style of the ranch ale? Ranch ale. That's all you get. I'll go dry rub. Going with the dry rub, Dan. What do you think? Oh, that's that's a good that's a good take. Um. Oh man. Grits. What was the first option? Baked bean. Baked Roll beans. that beautiful bean footage. There are too many varieties <laughs> of baked beans. Too many different flavors you can get out of it. Right, but there is one, like, original flavor baked bean, right? Yeah, I guess that's true. I feel like you're trying to sell me on that answer. I'm just saying. Uh-huh, sure. It's yeah. like hummus. No, you're, There's all you're, kinds of flavors of hummus, but you're, hummus you're, is just... You're trying to justify your, your fake answer here. Um, I'm going to say... <laughs> you also put a lot of different things in grits. That's true. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say barbecue rub, too. He's <laughs> saying the barbecue rub and finally stuff. I'll say grits, just to change it up. Watch it fucking be baked beans. I'm going to kick myself. Grits was my second choice, by the way. Okay, all right. Steph, uh, bucking the trend for the first time, somebody answering differently. Uh, This time, it did not work out for you because the answer is barbecue driver. Okay, good. (laughs) Damn it. So So you were trying to sell me on saying baked beans. Good job. I was (laughs) trying to sell you on saying baked beans. Good job. I almost almost took the bait. But I generally, I did genuinely think your logic was slightly flawed, too. So I was also just, you know. But there are different. Yes, you're right. There is a standard baked bean. Like, if you went to a restaurant and said, I'll have a bowl of baked beans, they're not going to say, what flavor? Well, then I'm going to a different restaurant. (laughs) And then Dan says, Nashville Hot Chicken. Obviously. (laughs) I don't know. I just have a problem adding something that has a liquid component when that liquid is not a fermentable sugar. Yeah, and yeah. it's just so viscous and it would it would mess with a lot. But the rub is more of like spices and seasoning, which can make sense because it's like yeah, cayenne and like salt and like yeah. those things all like are in beer. Yeah. 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 Sometimes. Yes. Sometimes. This beer is called uh, Pitmaster Apprentice. There we go. It is an ale and it has seasonings in it. I told you I don't have a lot of information. I'm sorry. I'm assuming one of them's cumin. I'm assuming there's salt. I'm assuming there's paprika and all that good stuff. Not a lot of details out there, but barbecue dry rub was, in fact, the correct answer. So we've come now to our final beer of the game. And in time honored tradition, this is where we add up all the points so far so that we can give whoever is struggling a slight advantage on the last question and the person struggling in this game. But only one wrong answer so far is Steph with two points. Dan and Rob tied with a perfect score, three points apiece. So we are going to let Steph guess last so she can strategically answer based on what you guys say. So we'll just swing back to Dan to go first on this one. Lastly, we come to a beer that has not one or two, but a whole list of unusual ingredients. It starts again with a Pilsner. Then we add the classic Mexican combo of salt and lime plus peppercorn for good measure. But then things start getting intense. The ingredient list concludes with Dan, is it? Habanero pepper and sun-dried tomatoes? Oh, it's a combo? Ghost pepper 
and dehydrated peaches. Oh, shit. Oh. Or mace and broken glass. Well, I mean, <laughs> clearly it was made on the streets of Kensington. <laughs> um, Yikes. Mm, man. I mean, I have powdered mace in my spice cabinet, so. Yeah, mace is le- a legit spice. It's not just. Oh, no, I know. It's not just the pepper spice. spray or whatever. But the broken glass is what leads me to think Kensington. Also a legit spice. <laughs> <laughs> Broken glass is now your drag name, Wayne. Oh god! Oh, I love it. I will totally take oh, that. Oh man! Uh, I'm gonna say that down. Um, habaneros and whatever you said with habaneros. The first one. Yeah. All right. Dan is saying habanero and pepper. Uh, sorry, habanero peppers and sun dried tomatoes is what Dan said. Rob, it's either that ghost pepper and dehydrated peaches or the aforementioned mace and broken glass. Ghost pepper peach. Ghost Pepper Peach, says Rob. And finally, Steph. Steph's yeah, going to say Ghost Broken pepper Glass. Peach. No, Ghost Pepper Peach, and I want that beer. Ghost Pepper yeah, Peach. That sounds awesome. Says mm-hmm. Steph, that sounds really delicious. Unfortunately, you will never be able to try it because it was habanero peppers and sun-dried tomatoes. Well, oh. we can we can collab and make it at our town, and then it will yeah. be a beer. I came up. I was just coming up with, like, random this sure and can. that. Sure like, can. pepper and something. I went. I wrote that. Actually, I was like, that actually sounds like it would be good. <laughs> what if? What if it actually would have been Mace and Broken Glass, and we all just would have been like, "Wow, what the fuck?" <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's regulations against putting broken glass in here. <laughs> well, I mean, there's probably regulations against a lot of things that people just ignore. It's one of those things. That, well, if we only sell it in the tap room, it's right. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> it's only for a fest. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Somebody just has it's... to take one sip of it somewhere, and then they can say they sold it. No. Yeah. Yep. All right, so we add up the final. Oh, I didn't tell you about this beer. I'm sorry. I'm I'm all over the place. So this is it's from Tanaya Creek Brewery, which is in Las Vegas, and it's called Olada Chalada. So Chalada and Michelada are traditional Mexican beer cocktails, somewhat Bloody Mary like, occasionally paired with clams and consumed either for pleasure or as the punishment for losing a trivia game on a podcast. <laughs> Long-time listeners may remember that we've had some experience oh, with oh. Clamata. Hello! Oh, look at those wings! Oh, you do have wings! Oh, those are so cute. Oh, oh my gosh, I love, oh, I love it. Them. Beautiful. So I like Short your shirt, too. Oh, you have wings, too. Oh, you both have wings! Oh, you both have wings. Awesome. <laughs> oh, I love the wings. Awesome wings. Uh... So yeah, uh, habanero pepper and sun dried. This was the answer on that one. So adding up the final, final, final scores, the big winner tonight with a perfect four out of four score is my co-host and lifelong brother Dan, Woo! coming in just behind with an almost perfect score, three out of four. Our esteemed guest Rob Woo! and Steph. With a 50% hit rate that it sounds bad, but in Happy Fun Time Games, 50% is actually that's pretty that's good because we usually don't do more than like three to six questions. Steph has two. I do want to mention that Tanaya Creek did brew this beer a second time for the tap room. A lot of people said it was very heavy on the tomato. And a lot of people said that it made them want pizza. Oh, I can oh, see that. Okay, okay. Tanaya Creek has brewed many beers with pepper, so... Tanaya Creek when, has been in past games. Yeah. Well, you, I assume you guys have been there since we've all been to Vegas to visit our family. No. You've never been there? I've, no. I've never been there. I've been to... No. It's one of the more OG breweries in yeah. Vegas. Love Lady and the one on Fremont. Yeah. Did we, oh, you Which didn't even get to the there. one across the street from Love Lady uh, that year. That was Mojave Brewing? They're really yeah, good. I, yeah, I've never been to Yeah, those. and uh, Banger was the one that was on Fremont Street. And then one ne- Neon City, the one that had the 15 levels of spiciness with the hot beer. Oh, my God. Best. You had to be in heaven. Oh, I was. And <laughs> you know I had the spiciest one. Of course. They- well, yeah. So they have... Th- now, Rob, this was my question, too, because, you know, the reason I started brewing was to brew spicy beers. I'm like, how on earth do you have 15 iterations of this beer on tap? What they do is they have the base beer... And they have the level 15 of the beer, and then they have a chart with ratios. So if someone mm. orders a level 7 spiciness, they do the 50. ratio of, you know, this much base beer and this much of the fifth. Well, no, they had 14 and 15. 
those two they had, but there's there's a whole conversion chart of how they pour them. So it's really only three kegs, but they have like 15 different beers from combining those kegs. Spice is tough. Yeah, we did. Uh, you know, it's funny when, I, when you said that. We, we, we did a beer. It was just, again, it was, just, it was a single keg. There was a Queen cover show at a local theater. I forget exactly. And we, they, they wanted a beer for it. And they were like, it'd be cool if you could do something. And so we had a brown ale that we did with peach and habanero and we called it mr fahrenheit Ah. (laughs) you know for freddie mercury and uh but it was tough because like we threw habanero in and i was so afraid of it going like over the top and being like terrible that like when i tasted it it just had the throat tickle and it wasn't hot enough i was like damn it (laughs) you know and then it's just like it's done you know you can always back blend it um and like cut heat but i just like didn't have time to be like playing with it over and over again hi sweetie um, so I just kind of, sorry, uh, Hi. Kind of <laughs> did it once and it was like not hot enough, but heat is so tough because especially for, it's, you know, it's so personal too. It's like people either you're like thrilled with it or I don't know. It's just like way too much. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I love their take on this because I mean, they're in Vegas. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a gimmick too, which I think, I think is, it's cool and I'm fine with that, but yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I'm sure people that aren't quite as in love with chili beers like I am, maybe they'd be willing to try it. They're like, all right, I'll do like a level two. And, you know, it's no different than going to an Indian restaurant and telling them what spice level you want in your food. So why not in your spicy beer too? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Every time we do a pepper beer, which is not often because I don't personally love them that much. Like I think they're interesting, but they're not like in my, and like we've, I've been the only one in the brewery for the last like almost three years. So, Every once in a while, someone will ask. I'm like, oh shit, yeah, we should totally do like a like, one off. Like, we did, we did like a jalapeno lime for Cinco de Mayo, you know, just because mm-hmm. we were like in our uh, um, uh, what I do it with my German pills, and I was like, yeah, it'll be just something to like throw a bone at that chili pepper person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Yeah, yes, I'll tell you. Yeah, we're talking about doing one again though. Now, now I want to do peach and spice this summer. It's a good combination, yeah. peach and yeah. habanero, peach and ghost pepper. Yeah, yeah, I love the, the, the trick. So, if you're going to brew with ghost pepper, you should uh, you definitely have to combine it with other peppers because, like, ghost peppers and scorpions give you heat, but they don't have like the lovely flavor that like jalapenos and habaneros do. So, whenever I would do a ghost chili beer, I would do like one ghost chili, but then add a lot of other peppers with it chilies. to give the, yeah. the complexity and the flavor. So you got the heat, but you also had a good pepper flavor. Mm. That's smart. Yeah, we did a scorpion pepper vanilla bean beer at Springhouse went in our smoked porter for a uh, uh, pig roast one year, and you couldn't even fucking drink it. Like, it was... <laughs> I bet Every single good. time, like, every day we were open after the festival, people would drink out of it. We would top the keg back up with, uh, like, just you know, base smoked quarter just to dilute mm-hmm. the pepper. So like, it was like the giving tree. It was just the keg that wouldn't kick. <laughs> so we kept topping it up to make it more palatable. And then, you know, Matt was just like, just add a little more beer. It'll be fine. And eventually it hit a sweet spot. We're like, Ooh, that's great. You know, but spice and smoke go really, I have a habanero Roush beer that I used to brew Ooh. all the time. And that, Oh, I love that freaking beer. They just, the smoke, because the smoke is so strong and it can stand that heat and that flavor. It's a, it's a I'm sure I would have loved the beer, but. It's have not you had the smoked Schwarz beer out at Bespoke in Strasbourg? Uh, I they didn't have that. I've only been there once. I don't John, think they had that. John one. is like one of the nicer people I've ever met. I feel like I'm a pretty nice guy and he makes me feel like I'm an asshole. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's possible. <laughs> John is very kind. He's just like. Really, I don't know. He's just, I, I'm like, man, you are so damn nice. Um, but he, he makes really, really great beer. And he made uh, smoked uh, Schwarz beer. And we blind tasted it against Suarez. Uh, and I just picked the one I liked better. And I picked John's. Um, you know, Suarez makes stupid good lagers. Um, yeah. So, yeah. If you like smoked beers, uh, he usually puts it out in the fall, so keep an eye out for it. I definitely will. Thanks for yeah. the tip. Sorry, Wayne, I didn't even let you close out the <laughs> game. Oh, yeah, we still have game stuff to do. I kind of forgot. <laughs> uh, thank you for playing. Thank, thank you for, for listening. 
at home, I forget what I say at this point of the podcast. Oh, this is the part of the podcast where we shout out to our most generous patrons on Patreon. We would like to thank the following list of individuals with the most sincerity that we can muster, beginning with Jen McDonald. Wiener Schnitzel. Eric Dixon. Just the tip. Dana. Pay my annual fee, motherfucker. Oh, they're a kid's present. Sorry. James Lambert. Oh, let me find it. Uh, nope. Wait, hold on. Hold that thought. There we go. It's literally full of couches. That's one of my favorites. Chris Mahoney. <laughs> okay. Sean Sullivan. That's drugs. <laughs> That's what I am. Favorite. Son of no. a. No. Nope. Hold on. That had cursing in their kid's present. Um, no hashtags. No hashtags. Jill Chivers. <laughs> Uh, Jill. Oh, it was nice seeing Jill at uh, uh, Logjam. Logjam. Yeah, that was that was a fun time. Joe, uh, the one and only, that is no baloney. I almost got to say it. Forgive me, Joe. Joe Mansell. I love a good corned beef hash. I really do. I had an amazing corned beef hash <laughs> in Cape Cod at this breakfast place we went to called Ann and Franz. We went there twice. It was so good. And I got it as a side because I also wanted the pancakes. Uh, Topher Simmons. Oh, yeah. And finally, Ben Mengel. Delicious. Indeed. If you want to find out how you can get on this esteemed list and other behind the scenes perks and just help us keep this train chugging along, you go to patreon.com slash beerbusters to learn more. And now here are some commercials to pay our tab. So you bond. Uh, remember when I said I'd have to send away to NASA to calculate your bar tab? <laughs> oh, yeah. We all had a good laugh, Mo. The results came back today. <clears throat> you owe me 70 billion dollars. Do you like beer? Do you like swag? Of course you do, assuming you didn't find us by mistake. The Beer Busters swag shop is back and better than ever. We've taken the Beer Busters logo and slapped it on some t-shirts and hoodies. And if that's not your style, there are all new original design beer style logos. Whether you're a lager guy or gal or part of the haze craze, there's a logo for you. Already have too many shirts and hoodies? Me too. Slap a sticker on your computer, kegerator, or forehead for the world to see. Or pin a button to your backpack, your jacket, or your beer cooler on your brewery adventures. Head on over to beerbusters.threadless.com and find your new favorite wares right now. The bed and breakfast that we stayed at in Chicago, they had a whole separate vegan menu for breakfast oh, that cool. you could order from. It was very lovely. It was surprisingly difficult to find vegan options in Cape Cod. Not impossible. Jess ate fairly well, but it was it was more of a challenge than she expected, and more of a challenge than I was expecting. Um, but there were a decent number of places that had more than one vegan option. It was like, oh well, you could just have this salad. Like there, you actually had some choices. But I remember one time uh, I visited my brother for Christmas. It may have been the first Christmas he was out in New Mexico and we did uh, a mini trip down to like Roswell and we went down to uh, what the hell is the cave called at the border of Texas and New Mexico. The hell is that cave Carlsbad? Called? Yes, Carlsbad Caverns. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but on the way, my brother was insistent on stopping at this barbecue place. I think it was outside of um, outside of Roswell somewhere. And I was a strict vegan at the time. And literally the only thing they would serve me, they, they could serve me, was their side salad, which was this big with no dressing. Oh, my God. None of their dressings. They didn't even have like all they had like ranch or like blue cheese. They like they didn't even have a, like they didn't even have oil and vinegar. So I ended up going to a grocery store after we eat dinner <laughs> so I could get something to eat. But oh God. Yeah. it's like it feels like McDonald's really like. Well, I'll just take the vinaigrette yet. Then that has to be vegan. Oh no, there's pork in the vinaigrette. Why is there pork in the vinaigrette? <laughs> like, well, you can't have the fries being? at McDonald's aren't vegetarian. Yeah, exactly, because they, they have like beef. I heard they stopped using that. They probably did because it's like an urban legend that like really looks bad on them. But I don't know that they have stopped using it. I'll have my fact checker check that because it's pertinent information to this podcast. <laughs> it really is. It really is. <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. But uh, 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 Anne and Franz uh, just got a tofu scramble. Um, that was, she said, the best she's ever had, and I tried it, and it was fucking delicious. Oh, that's good. So, I highly recommend Anne and Franz in Barnstable, Cape Cod. If you're ever there, check it out. I don't know if I make travel re- recommendations, so I want to make one. Proud of you for traveling. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is true. Usually I'm the one that makes travel recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> I like it. Rob, what's currently on? What are the big, uh, the popular items on your food menu right now at our town? Um, well, maybe the question should be, what do you like to eat there? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Well, honestly, I mean, the, the kitchen is not open many hours that I'm there because I'm like, you know, brewing during the day and then I like roll out shortly after we open. But so I don't actually like sit and eat there very often. But um, number one seller like kind of is and always probably will be just like soft pretzel. Like, it's so classic, like brewery is just like four ingredient, you know, like flour, salt. Uh, yeast. <laughs> Yeah, you, I'm sorry. I'm like my son's just cracking me over here. Uh, <laughs> but it's like cla- just a classic soft pretzel, and it's, and it's baked like 30 minutes from the brewery. It's awesome. It's a really good pretzel, um, and we serve it up with like you ever been like Frankfurt Hall? They do that that cold Obatsa beer cheese. Yeah, mm-hmm. we do a, we do a riff on that, so we do like a cold cold German beer cheese, and it's awesome. So that's like kind of isn't always will be like number one seller, but we sell a crap ton of smash burgers um, and like. It's pretty sandwichy. Like, yeah, we don't have deep fryers. So it's just like, it's very sandwichy, like a notch up from cafe ish. I don't know. It's hard to describe. But it, yeah, we, we sell a lot of iterations of smash burgers and, and like cheese steaks and, and some chicken sandwiches and stuff. Not not Nashville hot chicken okay. sandwiches. It's all right. You do have a jalapeno popper grilled cheese that caught my eye when I was looking at the menu oh. earlier. That yeah, that's a cool incredible. one. With, that sounds yeah, so good. Raspberry jam on there. That's a cool one. We, nice in fact, we, we did that sandwich as a burger at one point, too. Um, <laughs> same thing, but with Smash Burger. Yeah, it was, it was good. Sorry, I'm not sure who's vegan at this point or not. That's the conversations <laughs> you guys are having. But, um, <laughs> the only vegan on the call right now is Steph. And Currently. And most of the time. Veg- vegetarian. Yeah. yeah. Hey, oh, cheese okay. is good. Um, cheese is good. I'm just, we've, I'm just we've, married we've, to a vegan. We um, We've struggled to to succeed with vegan food um well you guys have root literally a block away so you should put in with root is an amazing vegan restaurant in lancaster for anyone that's not familiar and jess i keep telling her she and i need to meet there so you just need to put a little caveat in your menu if you're a vegan we will gladly pick a food from root for you and bring it to the brewery yeah that's not a bad option yeah i mean like and honestly if somebody walked in with like a to-go box from root i'd be like that's fine how about it um just because like yeah we don't service it well because like we've just find it we found it like extremely difficult to maintain that level of fresh stuff for items that don't pull through like we carried some vegan items and they just we ended up losing a bunch of money on like holding things and i'm sure if we had like someone who was just like running the kitchen that was like all about veganism they would probably knock out of the park and be able to like manage that better but that's not the position we're in at the moment. So like we've tried to like to, to offer some things and, and, and have them again, not have them be like, well, just get the greens. Like that sucks. You know, that's not fun. Like when you're like, I want to go out to eat. So I want to experience something. And so that, that's the worst when they're just like, have a bowl of lettuce with nothing on it. Like, that's the worst. <laughs> yeah. um, we can, I mean, I have had we can give you that by the way, we can you... get you a bowl of lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you um, want. Yeah. I have had uh, the soft pretzel at our town, and it is pretty amazing. So, yeah, and our uh, our vinaigrette does not have pork in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it, it is challenging. We we do we do vegetarian. I feel like a little more justice. Like we have a mushroom cheesesteak um, that a lot of people like, but it is like the mushrooms are cooked in butter. You know, so it's yeah. like not it's not being um, and it's on a. You know, and usually people putting cheese on it. Like we we even, we we did try we, we we messed around a little with getting some like some vegan cheeses in from there. There's a local company that does it. And again, we were just kind of struggling to. It's just I think like anything is just always easier when you do more. You can like mm-hmm. you know the pull through is just quicker, so you can mess around. So it's not been something we we've, we've focused on. If I'm being just totally honest, um, it's been yeah. it's a challenge. It's been something that we worked on more in the early days. Um, and have like tried to like focus on on keeping margins where they need to be and 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 being smart with like food waste and stuff like that. And so we've taken a taken a step back and just tried to be honest with people. Like we don't have a great vegan selection. Like when they message us online, so they'd be like, "Well, we'll try to do our best to 
like we we're we're not doing our best to, <laughs> to service a vegan. Like we're just not. Like if we're just being yeah. us, you can't you can't truly like um, hit every single market. And so it's kind of like, all right, if I'm being honest, like this is not a great place for you to come to eat. Like I, it's plenty of beverages here. I can and our staff should be able to walk you through like what doesn't doesn't have any sort of like animal products in it as far as the beverages go. But like yeah, it's not it's not a perfect place. Like come here in between lunch and dinner type of thing. So yeah. I mean, we have a couple of things that are like passable, but it's not a great place for a meal for someone who's vegan. I guess I'll say. Well, and I think it's, I mean, I, th- I think it's important to be honest about that. Like you are, and that's perfectly fine to be like, yeah, we just don't have, you know, it's just not working for us at the moment. I think it's also really difficult for small businesses whose primary focus isn't food to offer good vegan options while still maintaining that local fresh, because like, what are your options beyond me? That's not local. That's not even really good for you if we're being honest. And like you say, there's a local vegan cheesemaker, which is nice, but like, that's not easy to find. So you're going to be And it's not it. cheap. Yeah, and you're going to be using really expensive products, so you're like kind of like violating that local, you know, kind of aspect. And and you know, fortunately, that, that sort of thing is starting to change, and a lot more local vegan focused companies are popping up. But yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to expect a small business that isn't a restaurant to like have a ton of vegan options all the time. Like it's just you know, it's just not not quite feasible yet for everybody. But it's getting there. Yeah, you know, so it's just I think we just got better about being honest about what we have and what we can do. So yeah. Dana I, I, is like today, ho- today, Dana is behind me reading the description of the jalapeno popper <laughs> in like a very dreamy voice. It see, it sounds really it does good, sound good, right? <laughs> She's that like, oh good. my God. So there you go. We'll meet you guys there. And okay. um, you can all have the, the grilled cheese. Yeah. Oh, I did want to tell this. I don't go is- to I did want to tell one quick anecdote, and I, I and since we're talking about veganism, uh, this is really funny. When we were on our, our honeymoon recently, I went we went to a restaurant, and I got a lobster risotto, and it came with Fancy. literally, yeah, literally half a lobster, like a lobster cut in half on my plate, right? Not a whole lot of meat in it, so I was like, well, not much meat in this lobster, but I got you know the experience of having like whatever. So I'm like complaining about how little meat in it, and my wife. The vegan says, let me help you, <laughs> picks up the lobster and starts digging the meat out of the lobster for me. On my plate. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So my wife I is a vegan, but she's also a total fucking badass. <laughs> I would yeah, not know how awesome. to do that. I would not know how to do that. Yeah. How does she yeah. know how to do that? Because she would be the first one to tell you she's not a vegan because she doesn't like eating animals. They taste good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not about, you know, her being squeamish about that kind of thing, you know. I just didn't grow up eating seafood. That wasn't something that we did. So even, I mean, I ate meat up. I mean, I've been a vegetarian, what, half of my life? So I I ate meat the first half of my life. But there's a lot of seafood stuff that I've never, honestly, probably the only seafood I've had is our grandmother used to make fish sticks. Oh, yep. And I would douse them in ketchup so I couldn't taste them. And I remember one time I tried salmon and I almost puked because I hated the taste of it. Oh, I, I love just don't salmon. Have, I just don't, vegetarian or not, I just don't have the experience eating seafood. Hmm. It seems like a lot of work, though, for a meal. I don't like to work that hard. That's why I don't do crab legs. It's too much. I like crab, but nope. That's kind of <laughs> much work. how I feel. That's how I feel about homebrewing anymore. Yeah. It's, just, it's just a lot of work. I can just go to our town and have a few pints. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, speaking of unless our you're town, really bored and have nothing else to do, or you really want to open a brewery, just go to a brewery. Just go. Yeah, to people. <laughs> exactly. Uh, speaking of our town, where should people go if they want to find out more besides the brewery itself and the soon to be Philly tap room? Yeah. Um, online. We're at uh, our town um, on Facebook and Instagram. We're at our town brewery. Uh, everything's super simple with socials. Um, and then it's uh, our town, Philly. Oh boy, this is new. <laughs> this town, one's not simple. Our town tap room, Philly. Oh, the Philly one has the its new own one. Okay. handle. Yeah, we were on Instagram. We just we literally just put up a picture of the front and like tried to like cross promote a little bit. And then we're gonna start uh, having some like construction updates and yeah, because it's there's gonna be like you know like the the tap room in Philly does not have a kitchen. Um, it's just it's just a tap room. So. Uh, we want to make sure that we're like really clear about what beers are at each place and what events are at each place and not try to like commingle and confuse people. So 
Uh, well, of course, while you're on the internet looking up our town, uh, you can follow along with our social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We are at Beer Busters. Facebook, we are Beer Busters Podcast. There's BeerBustersPodcast.com, where you can also add slash shop to the URL. Uh, there is YouTube, where we are Beer Busters Podcast. There's Patreon.com slash Beer Busters, where uh, as little as a dollar a month gets you access to all the cool, you know, behind-the-scenes goodies and archives and whatnot and it's a good time i promise and the warm fuzzy feeling of supporting our podcast yes speaking of warm and fuzzy moo looks like she is giving us the death glare because we are keeping her human from snuggling i honestly thought that she was going to climb on the table and accidentally hit the outro music (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) exactly well uh rob i want to say thank you again for joining us man this is a lot of fun yeah, right on. Yeah, really nice chat with you guys. Likewise, likewise. And uh, next time I'm in Lancaster, I will most certainly stop at the brewery. And, of course, eh, the one in Philly is going to be like three miles away from me. It's going to be an easy, easy yeah, time man. to get there. Dude, yeah, it's, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, start, start a bird season. We'll have beers flowing for you down there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Ridge Avenue is actually pretty close to me. I'm just, just oh, yeah, it is close to you guys, too. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, Steph, you got to come down to Philly, then. I always say I will. That's true. And you do. You do come down here fairly often. I do. I come visit you more than you come visit me. I yes. very true. I'm gonna reserve comment. <laughs> uh yeah, you're right. I know. I'm I'm bad about following through and getting back places. <laughs> Although you will have to come up to come to our town and the new poor man's poor man's tap room opens. Yes. By the time this episode airs, it will be open mm-hmm. on Main oh, Street yeah, in Africa, the Hoagie House. So we're very, very excited for Ryan and Sam and the whole poor man's family and they have a glass dishwasher now oh <laughs> very exciting. the entire dishwasher is made out of glass it's crazy. <laughs> yes. and then they're Top gonna to break bottom. it and put it in beer yep yeah um yeah no i'm going there tomorrow for uh their soft opening i'm really excited nice. yeah uh, we, we are sending someone on our behalf because none of us c- can make it but we will we're, we're sending someone on our behalf to at least take some pictures so we can post you are in motherfucking ohio I am in. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I will be back in Pennsylvania by that time, but probably not quite home yet. But it's okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll eat. Just... Uh, I'll eat a side salad for you. <laughs> no, I want you to try all the hoagies for me, please. All right, I'll do. All right, all right okay, eat. whatever. I'll try. Right, I'll, I'll eat a bunch of cold cuts. <laughs> eat a bunch of oh, cold darn. cuts. <laughs> I want a full report on how all the hoagies are. Yeah, now I'm gonna hit it up. I'm gonna gather up the wife and the kiddos, maybe with the fairy wings on. Who knows? <laughs> they should, yes. You should get matching fairy wings, you and the wife. We can all be uh, fairies together there. The whole family. That'd be cool. Nice little family gathering and outside everybody's got their wings. Yeah. Do yeah, whatever you want to do. Now. <laughs> Including busting into the podcast. Hope you guys can edit that, whatever that was. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, man. They are adorable. They are. They are. Yeah, um, they're awesome. Well, un- And in the future, they can listen to these episodes and. Bingo. Uh, Learn yeah, when they're because they probably they'll have like vague memories of COVID, but when they're adults, they can listen back, like Steph was saying, and just be part of the, the history. Yeah, my my five year old doesn't know. He doesn't remember. I showed him a picture of himself wearing like a face shield at his first day of preschool. He doesn't remember it. Mm. Oh wow! Mm. Yeah, he's just like he's mask. like he's like, what is that on my face? He doesn't remember the masks or anything. Wow. I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. That's probably good. Yeah. Yeah, my daughter was born like she was born in july of 2020 so she was wow. oh wow she yeah. doesn't know she doesn't know it all yeah like i had to wear a mask while my wife was in labor it was crazy jeez um, no, god bless you your be there. wife oh my gosh yeah. your wife for giving birth during covid god bless her well, uh, yeah she was serious. she had she wasn't allowed to take her mask off until they passed her rapid test so she was like actively having contractions like in labor and they were like, keep that mask on, sweetie. And she was like, Are you fucking kidding? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I can't breathe. Yeah. Wow. Bridget's sister, so. my girlfriend's sister had a baby in January of this year. Uh, the week before they were going to induce labor, her and her husband got COVID. Actually, the same night I got COVID for the second time. Um, and when she was in the hospital, they weren't sure if it was going to be a, a natural delivery or if they were going to need to do a C-section or whatever. Uh, and turns out that after trying to induce and after her uh, epidural falling out while she still had to wear her mask during all of this, they're like, yep, C-section time. She's like, you fuckers, you motherfuckers. I can't do this anymore. And she just ripped the mask off and like would just yell at anybody who tried to tell her she had to put it back on. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, that, that's, that's rough. 
<laughs> Makes mm. opening a business during COVID not sound so bad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, try, yeah right. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> try like bringing life into the world. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, One of the uh, audio adapters is yelling at me, so I feel like I have to say, unfortunately... Yeah, we, we, we were ending the show, and then we... Yeah, it finished. happens. Unfortunately, <laughs> this brings us to the end of another episode of Beer Busters, and I'm very excited to see what is happening in the world of our town, and I'm very happy that your first expansion is going to be in my city, because that means it's going to be easier for me to get beer, and hopefully you will have a Nashville hot chicken sandwich at this location. Was that at so least, Philly? At least, at least for the food truck or a pop at some point. Or of course, just, yeah. Keep or like one. a picture on the wall or something. There we go. <laughs> there <you> go. <laughs> Jeez. Rob, I'm thanks so again, man. This this has been so great. Dan's uh, Nashville hot chicken. Right. Uh, well, hey, yeah, I'm yeah, Dan Baker. If you're, if, you're in, uh, if you're in Lancaster, hit me up. Love to have beer with you guys. I know I can be able to catch up with Steph. Um, it's been a while, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're 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 Philly. You know, just yeah, let us know if you're if you all are around and uh, catch up with you guys. Well, we ran out of music, but my name is Dan Baker. I'm joined by my co-host and brewologist, Steph Hefner, and of course the Dimension and Fermented Wayne Baker. Remember, it's not about the liquid; it's about the experience. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. And it's about the sandwich. And I've been broken glass, and we've all been fabulous. <laughs>